it's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the OSD on-screen display menu system of the Gigabyte M27Q. The OSD controls are found at the rear, there's a joystick there to control the OSD, and there's also a dedicated KVM button, and I'll show you both of them very shortly. There's also a power LED just towards the bottom right there, little pinprick design as I like to call it, glows white when the monitor's on, and it flashes white when the monitor's on standby. The joystick also acts as the power button, so if you hold it in for a few seconds, it powers the monitor off. Alternatively, once you press it in, just once, so you click it in, you can then select power off. And there's a little quick radial menu that comes up, has various different functions there. If you twiddle it left, right, up or down, it has different functions as well before you actually enter that little radial menu, so before you click the button in. So to the left allows you to adjust the volume. And you can actually customize some of this functionality, and I'll show you that shortly. Up, by default, allows you to adjust the black equalizer, and I'll show you that when I'm in the main menu system. To the right, allows you to switch the input used by the monitor. And if you press that down, you can change the picture mode used by the monitor. So these are the presets. And again, I'll go through these in the main menu when I get there. So back to this little radial quick menu, as I like to call it. If you press left now, you can go on KVM Multitask and you can set up the KVM functionality of the monitor. So it has two USB 3 upstream ports. It has USB B, which is your main upstream port, and it has a type C port, which acts as upstream. It also offers display port alt mode, and it offers a little bit of power delivery. I think it's 10 watts, so not a massive amount, but it does give a little bit of power. So it's pretty self-explanatory, this actually. If you go on KVM Wizard, it allows you to set everything up. So it's saying there, what is the system you're using, which is also connected to USB-B? So I've got my main USB upstream port connected to my system, and that system is connected through DisplayPort, so that's what I'm saying here. You could select something else here, if that's what you're using. And then for the Type-C display, so what display have you got connected through Type-C? Well, I'm not actually using that at the moment. I don't have a system which uses Type-C, but if I did, I could have it so Type-C is used for everything. Alternatively, I could have it so I have a system connected to HDMI 1, but I want to use the Type-C port for data transfer for that system, but only for the data side. So you can do that. It's quite flexible. It just gives you a reminder there of what you've selected. And when you select KVM switch here, it'll switch between them, or if you press that button that I showed you just before, the dedicated KVM button, it is exactly the same. It's just a very quick way of switching between these as a KVM switch. And if you really don't want to use that button, you don't want to accidentally press it or anything like that, you can disable it so it doesn't do anything. I don't actually use KVM myself, so it would have been nice to be able to set this button to do other things, but the functionality of the joystick, as I showed you, is pretty good anyway. KVM reset, so that just resets all of this to the factory defaults. It's power off, pretty self-explanatory. Setting, if you go up, so that's the main menu system. And there's Game Assist, which I'll just show you now. So there's Game Info, and that allows you to have an on-screen timer. It allows you to have a counter, which you have to configure using the OSD Sidekick software, and I'll show you that shortly. You can also change the info location, so where on the screen it's actually displayed. You can have it in various different locations, top right, the central region at the right or the bottom right, and the same on the left side of the screen. So I'm just going to have it top right at the moment. So it's got a timer, which is counting up, because that's what I set it to do. The game counter feature, which you have to configure, and it has a refresh rate display. So if you're using Adaptive Sync, that changes according to the frame rate of the content, and I'll just show you that very briefly. So I've got NVIDIA's Pendulum demo running now, and you'll see that's fluctuating all over the place as the frame rate of the pendulum changes. You also notice the polling rate is very quick here. So it does change very quickly. And when you're in game, the fluctuations can be a bit more erratic than they are in this pendulum demo. And sometimes it can be very difficult to actually see what exact frame rate is being read there. So it gives you a bit of an indication, but it's sometimes difficult to see exactly what it is. If nothing else, it's a good indication that the technology is working. If you see it just stuck at your static refresh rate and you're in a game and your frame rate is clearly changing, then it means that Adaptive Sync isn't working and isn't doing its thing. 
on-screen crosshair, you can actually customize the design in the OSD Sidekick software. And I'll show you that towards the end of the video. But the default style is just this little green cross here. So you can see that is in the middle of the screen. You can't change where it's displayed. It's always in the center of the screen. There's dashboard, and I'll show you that when I've actually got the Sidekick software open, because you do need to have it open for this to populate. But you can have various different things displayed there, such as the CPU temperature, CPU frequency, various other things you can see there, and a couple more in this list as well. You can change the dashboard location, so where it's displayed. So you can have it the top right, bottom right, bottom left or top left. And you'll see, because I don't have the OSD Sidekick software open, it doesn't populate any of this. And in fact, I'll just open the software now, why not, as I'm showing you all of this. I'm not going to go through the software itself, but I'm just going to get this to populate. So I've got the USB upstream cable connected, because you do need the USB upstream cable connected to use this Gigabyte software, the Sidekick software. And in a short amount of time, you'll see that now has populated. It doesn't all populate. I don't have an Aorus mouse, so it doesn't have the DPI setting there. Some of these read zero, and actually it is starting to populate some of the GPU data. I did see that go up just then. So it might be that when my GPU is used a bit more heavily, that goes in. So it's got the temperature at least now. And the frequency did go up a bit. So I've got the pendulum demo open. It's a little bit more rigorous. And you'll see the GPU frequency has gone up. And the usage rate is set to 100. I'm quite surprised that the pendulum is using 100% of the GPU, but that's what it's telling me. And it's got a fan speed, which is now populated as well. So this could be quite useful if you like that kind of information. And finally here, there's a display alignment feature, and that just gives you some little guidelines on the screen to help you set up multiple displays to line them up correctly. So onto the main menu now. You can see there's various different pieces of information at the top there. What it shows there changes depending on which section of the menu you're on. You'll also notice that there's blue coloration. For the Aorus models I've used, they have orange rather than blue. So that distinguishes just the regular Gigabyte models like this versus the Aorus models, the color of the, the colors used in the OSD, but the layout itself is the same. So first up's the gaming section. You can see that there's aim stabilize and aim magnifier. They're both grayed out. Reason for that is that I've got AMD FreeSync Premium active, which means I'm, it's actually adaptive sync. It's not specifically AMD FreeSync Premium only. This is the adaptive sync toggle of the monitor. You need to have that turned off to be able to use the aim stabilizer and the magnifier feature. The magnifier feature I've never seen before. It's quite interesting, actually. It would take some getting used to in a game, but I'm just going to show you what that does. So a magnifier. This magnifies the central section of the screen. And I suppose the idea here is that it would allow you to see enemies or whatever's in the center of the screen more clearly. It's a bit like having some kind of scope active all the time. But to be honest, the resolution, the definition, it might not be clear in the video, but it's not particularly sharp. So it isn't quite the same as having a sort of in-game zoom functionality, but I suppose it could have some utility. It's quite an interesting little feature. And you'll also notice you have to have this disabled to use aim stabilizer. Aim stabilizer is a strobe backlight setting and all you're gonna be able to see on the video, I do have to give you a warning about this, is some flickering. Actually, my camera's quite good at filtering that out, so it might not be too bad, but you will see some flickering on the video when I enable this as I'm about to do. So yeah, you can see that kind of strobing of the backlight. So it's refreshing at the moment at 170 hertz. You can use this setting at other refresh rates down to 120 hertz. You can use it at 144 as well, 165. And it's all explored in the written review, but this is just on or off for this setting. Next is Black Equalizer, so I've got Legom, that's legom.nl, the website, the Black Levels test open there. What you see here is a poor representation of what you'd actually see in person, although it will definitely show you the relative changes that this setting makes. So the idea with Black Equalizer is that it gives you a competitive advantage. 10 is the default. If you increase that to even one step up to 11, 
it greatly increases the visibility of these dark shades. It makes them lighter than they should be. You'll also see the background there is becoming quite light, quite flooded. That means that the static contrast is being affected as well. I don't actually much like this implementation, if I'm honest. I prefer more granular implementations, which would give you more flexibility and would not affect the black point. Because really, if you increase pure black, that's not going to help you in terms of your visibility. It just decreases contrast and could be potentially bad, actually, for visibility. So this is kind of a bit of a shotgun approach, if you like, to the black equalizer type technology. Some implementations are better. Some are worse, to be fair. If you decrease this, it gives a very cinematic look. If you decrease it even one to just nine, it makes things very crushed together. You lose a lot of detail. But you can adjust this according to preferences, and it does give you that competitive edge, which is really the main thing it's designed to do. And just to show you the background quickly, if I increase this, it lightens all of that up as well. It kind of floods things quite clearly for brighter shades. So it's really not very selective about what it's increasing. It really just is an extreme gamma enhancement and it also destroys your contrast. Next up, the super resolution. This is a sharpness filter. So if you increase that even to one, it makes things overly sharp. Increase it to two, it's a stronger effect. Three, stronger effect again. It does have some utility though. It's quite useful if you're running the monitor in a non-native resolution. It won't be to everyone's taste, but some people will actually really like this effect. So by all means do use that if you feel it's useful. Speaking of non-native resolutions, this is really where display mode comes in. There's full and aspect, and the rest is grayed out if you're using FreeSync, or more to the point, you've got Adaptive Sync active. So I have to disable that to be able to use the others. So I have disabled AMD FreeSync Premium, or Adaptive Sync. You'll now see that various options are available. I'll show you the first three where I've got a non-native resolution running. At the moment, I'm still using 2560 by 1440, the native resolution, but I will show you just now the little settings which emulate different screen sizes and aspect ratios. There's a 22 inch 16 by 10. And because I'm not using a 16 by 10 resolution, it does kind of squash things up a bit, looks a bit weird. But if you were using an actual 16 by 10 resolution, that would not have that kind of distortion. But you will get the black bars, of course, because this is a 27 inch screen. 23 inch 16 by 9, and you can see the distortion isn't there. And that's to say things aren't stretched because the 16 by 9 aspect ratio is being used still. There's 23.6 inch 16 by 9 and there's 24 inch 16 by 9. I'm now running in the full HD resolution. I've set my refresh rate to 144 hertz. If you've got it set anything above that, then it won't use interpolation on the monitor. It won't use the scaling process of the monitor. It will simply use GPU scaling instead and none of this will actually work. So full uses all of the pixels called for in the source resolution, uses interpolation, a scaling process to fill up the information there to the 2560 by 1440 pixels of the screen. Aspect, that will do exactly the same, but it will also pay attention to the aspect ratio. Of course, full HD is a 16 by nine aspect resolution, just like 2560 by 1440 WQHD. So, this does exactly the same as full, but if I was using a resolution with a different aspect ratio, this would actually pay attention to that. And it would give you some borders, some black borders without stretching stuff. Full, on the other hand, will just use the, all of the screen and it will potentially stretch things. And then there is one-to-one. -one. That's the one-to-one -one pixel mapping feature that will only use the pixels called for by the source resolution, and it will use a black border for the rest of the image. So that's a completely undistorted Full HD 1920 by 1080 pixels in the middle of the screen, black border for the rest. Next you've got Overdrive, so you can set that to various different options there. They're explored in the review. There's Auto, Picture Quality, Balance and Speed. Picture Quality is the best. I mean, there's not really much more to it, just use Picture Quality. I don't really think anyone's going to be wanting to use any of the other settings. I realise I've now set myself up for some trolls in the comments saying that they love the speed setting or something like that. But you know, each to their own. If you like that, that's fine. But in my opinion, picture quality is really the way to go. AMD FreeSync Premium, so that just enables or disables adaptive sync on the monitor. Next is picture, and that allows you to change the preset used by the monitor. So there are a few different options here. Most of these actually just change various options in the OSD 
and do things that you would be able to do manually. So FPS, for example, it sets the color temperature to cool. It actually shows you a lot of what it does. It lowers the gamma. It just makes things look flooded. The color temperature is too high. There's just general upset to the image. The sharpness is actually a bit too high as well. If you do like this look, then fine. But again, you can just make these manual adjustments to the image yourself if you prefer. RTS RPG just makes different adjustments. There's a lot of oversaturation. Movie, more of the same really, just makes different adjustments. Reader, this actually reduces the contrast slightly and gives a warmer look to the image. So you might find this kind of comfortable for the eyes. There are other settings of that sort, which I'll get onto shortly, that you can use for that purpose as well. sRGB, this is actually the more interesting setting because this is an sRGB emulation mode cuts down the color gamut as explored in the review and you'll see that brightness is really all you can change here in the picture setting. You do have access to some of the gaming settings as well. For example, you can change AMD FreeSync Premium or you can change display mode. It also grays out overdrive, which is quite interesting. I didn't realize I did that until just now, but um, it sets it to picture quality. You can see there, overdrive picture quality. So that's not a problem really. That's the setting I would use anyway. Custom 1, Custom 2 and Custom 3, they're fully customizable and they'll save various sets of settings basically to three different presets, so they're quite useful. I use them myself. So Custom 1 I have set up as my main test settings as I call them, and Custom 2 is the same but with the blue light filter applied and the color temperature set to warm. I use that for relaxing viewing in the evening and I'll come on to those settings when I get through them in the main menu system very shortly. So you can change the brightness, change the contrast. There's a color vibrance feature. This is a digital saturation boost. So if you increase this, it oversaturates things by pulling shades closer to the edge of the gamut, but it doesn't expand the gamut itself. So you lose shade variety, things are crushed together, things are oversaturated. If you like that look, then that's what this is for. You can increase this a bit. To be honest, this monitor has a lot of vibrancy natively anyway because of the color gamut. So I don't think many people should really want to fiddle with this. But perhaps if you do want to fiddle with it, it might be to reduce it slightly. You can do it the other way. I find it hard to get the balance right though. I find that even when I set this to nine, some shades just look really quite a bit more muted than I'd like. Others remain very strongly saturated. And if you try to get rid of the saturation for some of those extra saturated shades, so to speak, by decreasing this further, things start to really look quite weird and quite washed out in other ways. It's difficult to get the balance right, but this is just to adjust according to your own preferences. There's sharpness. So this is a different filter to the super resolution that I showed you before. It has a different effect, a bit of a milder effect really. You can increase this or decrease this according to your own preferences. I like the default of five, I find that optimal. Various gamma settings, off gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, gamma 4, gamma 5, all explored in the written review. Gamma 2 was best on my unit, but that might not be the same in all cases. And by best, I mean it was closest to the standard which I like to adhere to. Color temperature, cool, normal, warm, or user defined. So cool gives you a high white point. Normal is just the factory defaults. Warm is warm. <laughs> it gives you a low white point and it kind of acts as a low blue light setting. There's user define which allows you to manually adjust the red, green and blue color channels. And again, don't look at this and try and copy directly and expect it to be perfect on your unit. Might not be the case. Every unit's different. So this just is what worked on mine. There's low blue light. This is the main low blue light setting and you can set that between 0 which is disabled and 10 which is the strongest effect. So I said that I used some low blue light settings with my custom 2. I actually had this set to 10 for the low blue light and I also had the color temperature set to warm and that's because I actually find that even with this set to 10 it isn't it is a good effect. It does have a good effect. It lowers the blue channel quite a lot. It also gives a bit of a green look to the image because it maintains a strong green channel. And your eyes do adjust to all of this to, to some extent over time. So initially it looks really weird, but you do adjust. It's just that I prefer a slightly stronger effect. I like my white point to be well below 5000K as my low blue light setting. So I actually combined the two settings and that worked well for me, but I think it's still effective, this low blue light setting, if you set it all the way up to 10. 
The reason I like to do this in the evening is to minimise my exposure to blue light as that disrupts sleep hormones, that kind of thing. Not good before bed, puts your body in sort of a higher state of alert than it should be before going to sleep. Next is DCR, dynamic contrast ratio explored in the written review. Sense side demo, this is a bit of an odd one actually. What it's supposed to do is it's supposed to give you a split screen between the settings you're using before activating it and then any settings you select afterwards. But what it actually seems to do is it seems to have both sides of the image affected in certain ways. And I worked out earlier exactly what it is. It's that some of these settings can't be reflected. Brightness, for example, there's only one backlight. It controls the whole of the screen. So brightness is going to affect both of them. But it seems that the gamma settings also affect both sides. So you'll see when I change this, both sides of the image change. but it does reflect some of the changes that these presets will make. So one side of the image will be what I had before, the other side, I believe the, yeah, the left side is what I had before and the right side shows the adjusted image. And actually the sharpness filter is applied universally as well. It doesn't seem to do that for half of the screen. So it kind of just gives you a bit of an idea of some of the changes that the preset's gonna be making. That's really what it's for. Of course, it would be better if it had a complete side-by-side -side and it had more things change for half of the screen, but there are some technical limitations there. And there is Reset Picture, which will reset the picture settings. So that's just this section of the menu, the picture menu, to the factory defaults. There's then Display. You can change the input used by the monitor. There's HDMI PC range, and that's grayed out if you're using DisplayPort, as I am now. It's available if you're using HDMI. I can't remember exactly what they call the settings, and I checked the manual and it didn't really help because it doesn't actually tell you. But one of them will basically be your full range RGB, you might call it 0 to 255 or something like that. And the other will be your limited range RGB, 16 to 235. And most users would be wanting to use the full range RGB signal, 0 to 255. But there are some systems where it might be more applicable to use the limited range signal. The Nintendo Switch comes to mind, some older games consoles as well, but most of most of the newer games consoles and your PC, you want to be using the full range RGB, but you'd also have to make sure that your system's set up to use that as well. Overscan, again, grayed out unless you're using a system that's actually applicable to, and that would be an older games console. It's not applicable to newer games consoles or PCs. Next is PIP slash P by P, picture in picture, picture by picture. So picture in picture, this will give you your main source for most of the screen and that will give you a little box for your other source. I'm actually using both sources as the same thing. Basically just got a little box showing my computer and a big box showing my computer so they're actually the same thing. You can change the size of that box so it's large then or it can be medium or it can be small. You can change the box location as well. Left top, right top, left bottom, or right bottom. Display switch, which will just switch the inputs. So your primary and secondary source are swapped around. Audio switch, and that will select the audio source, either as your main or your subsource. And you can also change the sources themselves. So that's actually changing the subsource. So I had it set to display port, which is actually the same as my main source, which is why it was just showing me what it had before. But you can have HDMI 1, HDMI 2, or USB Type-C as your subsource instead. There's PBP, picture by picture. And again, you can select the sources used there. PBP size, so it can either have aspect, which means it isn't going to stretch things. If I select full, it will use all of one side of the screen, and you can see things are very distorted. But depending on the resolution you're using it, won't necessarily be that stretched. Just depends how much of the screen you want to use and if you want to put up with a bit of distortion. And then again, there's display switch and audio switch, which does the same thing as it did with PIP. Next, there's system, audio settings, volume or mute. This is for anything connected to the 3.5 millimeter jack. This monitor doesn't have integrated speakers. OSD settings, you can change how long the OSD remains on the screen after the last button press before automatically disappearing. You can set that to 5 seconds, 10, 15, 20, 25, or 30 seconds. And you can see there as well, you can exit just by pressing the joystick left a couple of times. You can change the OSD transparency level. 
OSD lock. So if you activate this, and then you try and use the joystick, you'll see the button is locked, confirm to unlock OSD. So it's very straightforward unlocking it. That's really just to stop accidental presses, or I suppose very young family members uh, messing around with things, messing around with the joystick makes it a bit more difficult to do that. There's quick switch, which allows you to change what happens if you twiddle the joystick up, down, right or left before you've actually clicked on it. So I was showing you that before. By default, up is black equalizer. You can, always, you can also have it so it activates aim stabilizer, low blue light, volume, input, contrast, brightness or picture mode. You can do the same with down, left and right. So that means you can adjust things like the volume, picture mode, depending on which way you twiddle the joystick before you actually click it in. There's other settings. Resolution notice. This just gives you a little notice in the middle of the screen just to tell you what resolution has just been selected. It can be quite useful actually if you are using a non-native resolution and you want to know if it's the GPU or the monitor doing the scaling. So if you select a resolution and it gives you that resolution in the little box, that means the monitor is actually running at that resolution. If you select a resolution and the box then just says 2560 by 1440, it means it's using GPU scaling or your system is doing the scaling instead of the monitor. Input auto switch, you can have it automatically select the input for you or you can disable that if you want to always manually select the input. Auto power off, this will power down the screen after a given amount of time. You can select the display port version, so 1.2 plus HDR or 1.2 plus that gives you the full functionality of the monitor, including HDR support and the full refresh rate and resolution support. 1.1 will knock off your HDR support. It will also knock off adaptive sync capability, so you can't use FreeSync or NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode. But it's just for older systems and older GPUs if you're using them. You see now it says AMD FreeSync Premium off and on is actually greyed out, that's because you can't use that over DisplayPort 1.1, you need at least 1.2a. And you can see that the refresh rate's down to 120 rather than 170, again bandwidth reasons. DisplayPort 1.1 is more limited in that respect. I've got it set to DisplayPort 1.2 plus HDR and that's just reminding me I haven't shown you the options that are available when you're running HDR because they're more restrictive. So when you've got HDR active, as I've just done now with the little toggle in Windows, of course if you running a game that has its own toggle, then just use that. So you'll see now when I'm in the picture menu, a lot of this is greyed out. So you can adjust the brightness, which is actually a bit strange to be able to do that under HDR, but you can adjust that, but you can't adjust contrast, color vibrance, sharpness, gamma, color temperature, or anything like that. And changing the preset has limited effect. All it does is it does have a sharpness filter attached to some of them. And I export all of this in the review. But if you go to the gaming section, you can change the usual things there, except for black equalizer. And of course, aim magnify and aim stabilizer, they may be greyed out just because I've got AMD FreeSync active. So I'll just disable that and see if you can activate them with HDR. See, this is a learning experience for me as well. And it says there, that's a little display input uh, notification, as I think they called it. So this is a learning experience for me as well, because I have not done this before. and. Um, I can see that I can't activate AIM magnifier or AIM stabilizer with HDR on. So that was educational for me. Very nice. But come to think of it, being able to use AIM stabilizer under HDR would be extremely strange. It is a strobe backlight setting. It has its own brightness regime and all sorts of things. That really wouldn't make much sense. That would be a quite strange combination to have. But uh, anyway, it was nice to confirm that you can't do that. Next is language, it just changes the language that the OSD is displayed in. Save settings, so you can save three different sets of settings, and this is all of your settings here. Um, so that actually encompasses a bit more than the custom one, custom two, and custom three. I didn't mention before, but when you change some things like the color channels, so you manually adjust the color channels, that's actually applied universally. So you can't have different color channel adjustments for red, green, and blue for custom one and different ones for custom two. You can select the presets like warm or cool or normal, for example, but you just can't manually adjust the red, green, and blue color channels. But if you use this save feature to save setting one, setting two, setting three, it will actually save everything, including that, do different little things 
to setting one, setting two, setting three, then you can load them quickly later if you like. And there's reset all, which resets everything to the factory defaults. So I'm now going to take a look at the OSD Sidekick software, and you can download that from the link given in the description of the video. It says process is running. I didn't even realize I actually still have it open. You can see it's open in the taskbar there. I've gone through this software with a few other monitors. It's really very much the same. You can see there are various different settings here you can change. You can also change the preset used by the monitor, but you'll note that custom one, custom two, and custom three isn't actually selectable here. But there's something called eSports Customize. This is a separate little thing just for the OSD Sidekick software that allows you to save all of these settings to a little profile and then you can load that later or you can give it to someone else to load up on their monitor. Also be aware that if you change things in the OSD, so I've actually got the custom setting, as you'll remember, custom one at the moment I'm using. If I change things on the OSD, for example, brightness, it doesn't change on this. So it doesn't reflect the changes I've made there. It doesn't do it in real time. You basically either use the OSD or you use OSD Sidekick at any one time. But if I reopen the software, it will reflect the changes. So it'll increase the brightness to 50, hopefully. Yeah, so it has reflected the change now. So that's good. If I change this to standard, for example, you can see it sometimes takes a while to actually load it. It does say when it's done it down there, it says FPS, RTS slash RPG, it'll say down there. So I then can't get back to my custom settings, so I'm showing you this without going into the OSD. Not a big deal, and I can just use the quick switch setting or whatever it was called to get back to that pretty quickly. I just would have liked to have seen the custom settings here as well. Just a bit of neater integration if they did that. But you can see lots of different functionality here. You can change all sorts of things. You can just read this in your own time. The interesting thing is the little crosshair editor here. So you've got three different sets of crosshair, one, two, and three. You select one, two, or three, and then press the little pen icon, and that allows you to edit this. This was just some weird design I did a while ago. I think it was for another monitor, actually, not for this one. So you can select the color the crosshair. So let's have, I don't know, a nice bright green. Actually, let's not because that's the default colour. And then you can just create your design, whatever it might be. Not very accurate, not very useful, not really very practical crosshair I've created here, but never mind. You can then press save and it will upload it to the monitor. Takes a little bit of time to do that. And now I've got this strange spirally blood type effect going on here, which is my custom crosshair design. There's also hotkey that allows you to assign hotkeys. There's actually really good functionality here. There are lots of different things you can assign to hotkeys. So you can see some of the functions here and other functions here. So for example, you can have the timer started or stopped, the refresh rate display on or off, super resolution, plus or minus, change picture modes quickly, Contrast, sharpness, color vibrance, low blue light settings, up or down. Volume, quickly switch the input or use the KVM functionality. And there are other ones here, timer, counter, black equalizer, crosshair, brightness, plus or minus, potentially useful as well. Aim stabilizer, volume, plus or minus, counter, off, dashboard, overdrive. So you can see there's a lot of different things you can set here and you can have it so you have to press control and something or shift and something, alt and something, or alt shift and something, or alt shift and control. You get the idea. Lots of lots of different combinations you can use and unlike some applications the changes will actually apply when you're in game or you're running a full screen application as well, not just when you're on the desktop. So that has good utility. General settings allows you to change the input, the OSD transparency level, the OSD display time, the idle timeout period. You can change the resolution and the frequency. Just a quick way to do that. And you can change what the quick switch does when you twiddle the joystick left, right, up or down. 
KVM Plus, this is just the same functionality I showed you in the OSD, but it just shows it nice and graphically. So you can see that I've got my main system connected with DisplayPort, and it's going to be using USB-B, which is the main upstream port. The alternative is to use your Type-C port as your USB upstream data transfer and whatever you've got connected to that with the display as well. It could be Type-C, HDMI, HDMI 1. If I wanted to use my Type-C data for DisplayPort, again, I could do that. And then you press KVM switch and it just switches that all around for you. In the same way as if you just press that dedicated button. About allows you to update the OSD Sidekick software, your build and the last version, which I assume is the latest version, although my version seems to be newer than the last version. Perhaps last version means the previous version you were running before this. I'm not entirely sure, but when I actually got the software, I got it from Gigabyte's website on the M27Q product page on the download section there. I then did live update and actually updated it with this to a newer version, slightly newer version. I don't know what it changed. It didn't seem to actually change anything as far as I know. But anyway, this is just an easy way to upgrade the Sidekick software if you feel like you want to update it. Auto update, you can have it automatically update for you if you prefer. Firmware version, it says last version unknown. So that is actually the latest version is unknown. That's because there hasn't been any updates to the firmware on this monitor or there hasn't at the time of recording anyway. There could be in the future and this is where you'll find them or you can, you'll find them on Gigabyte's website. But this should update if new firmware is available and you can just press download and it will just run through the process and apply it for you. And just to remind you again, you do have to have that USB upstream cable connected to use the Gigabyte OSD Sidekick software. So that's really all there is to the OSD on-screen display menu system, the Gigabyte M27Q. Be sure to check out the full review on pcmonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.